mute myself. Uh, All righty, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you for coming to our third Zoom call uh, for the tennis mechanics. Um, originally, I wanted to, um, it's my tennis company or academy or whatnot, but I wanted to start these um, just to have an opportunity to educate the parents on how to navigate through the world of tennis to get the most that it has for them and their, uh, their kids. And then secondly, to give our kids a fair shot at, um, at growing and learning the lessons that tennis has to, to, to teach and you know, um, having some of the resources for them to actually um, have a real career at this. So um, without further ado, to th this evening is going to be a coaches panel. And uh, let me go ahead and introduce our highly esteemed panel of, uh, of coaches. All right, starting with uh, Coach Greg Amerson. Um, he's been coaching high performance players for um, at least 25 years. Um, several of his players have been ranked in the top 10 in the USA. Um, and I had a, the privilege of, uh, of assisting him in one or two of them and has helped over 100 players um, receive college scholarships. I know it's not a part of his bio, but I want to throw in there that he uh, gave me um, one of my first shots at um, becoming a high performance coach and just kind of opened up the door and helped me learn some tough lessons, um, but really trusted me with higher level players and, um, and started me down this path that um, has got me here. Um, and I'm extremely grateful for that. Next, we have uh, Jermaine Jenkins. Uh, he's worked with stars like Venus Williams, Naomi Osaka and Coco Golf, and is in his post playing career, in his post playing career. Um, he's also served as Venus's hitting partner for three years in addition to the one season stint as Osaka's coach. Um, also, he was the assistant women's tennis coach uh, last year during the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. And he currently works at the USTA player development or with USTA um, player development on the women's side as a national coach um, in the transitional space. Uh, help us welcome Jermaine Jenkins. All right. Uh, it was also a personal homie of mine. I think we've known each other since we were like 10. 
Um, so yeah. And then Coach Tory, Coach Tory, Coach Tory Hawkins. So Coach Tory, um, he coached Scoville Jenkins. Uh, I know that's not necessarily the highest point, um, but the first African American uh, male to win the nationals at uh, Boys 18s at Kalamazoo. And Coach uh, Sco, uh, Coach Schofield, um, messing over my words. Coach Tory, Coach Hawkins, um, basically took him from scratch to the U.S. Open, and I think that is an amazing feat. In addition to um, tons of high-level, high-performance players who range everywhere from top ten in the country to top hundred in the ITF juniors. Um, if you all allow me, welcome Coach Tory Hawkins. Another mentor of mine who, you know, took me under his wing and spent some time and, and taught me a lot as far as organization and, and, and running a program is concerned. All right. And then last but not least, we have Nathan Pasha, who is a former All-American from UGA, um, career high 119 in doubles ATP, as well as 502 in singles ATP currently runs his own academy at Hudlow and is the assistant coach at Georgia Gwinnett College, which is the number one college in NAIA. If you all wouldn't mind giving a warm welcome to Nathan Pasha. All right. So now that we have, um, now that we have introduced the speakers, let's get into the questions. Now, uh, before we do, I know I'm, I'm, I'm still a rookie at this. Can you all tell me what you see? Is it just my big face on the screen? Somebody can unmute and let me know. I mean, it yeah, probably depends on the view. I got the grid yeah. view up. I see you. I see everybody. You see everybody. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So the view is based on you. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. cool. All right. So uh, everyone can answer this at their own rate. So uh, it's open to anyone, or I'd like to hear from everyone. What made you want to get into coaching? This is this is open to to I, I would like to hear from everyone. What uh what made you get into coaching and have the passion to do um the things that you that you did? Let me kick off, Tio. Okay. I had a real good coach myself, and I think one of the biggest things that I wanted to do as uh, uh, as a young man was to uh, have that have that impact on someone else. Um, I had a really good coach in juniors. I had a really awful coach in college. <laughs> and I decided that, you know, there would, if I was going to show my coach what a real coach was going to be. I also had a kind of a funny debt that my coaches back home made me, uh, that they made me commit to and to basically to clear my debt. I had to work with a young player. They'd work. And uh, Jermaine's older brother, Jackie, was that player. And it was kind of a funny thing that I had to repay my debt, in a sense, to my coaches through him. I had to pay it forward. So uh, I ended up, ended up being able to – his younger brother was uh, – we spent a lot more time together, me and Jay, and, and obviously Sco and a bunch of other players came through. But so to answer your question, uh, it was having a good coach myself. It was being able to be the recipient of some of that and realizing how much of an impact they made. And I was so grateful and so, so very uh, appreciative that uh, I wanted to pay it forward for someone else. Nice, nice. Any yeah, other feel like Yeah, I feel like we got a lot of legends on this call. So, um, yeah. you know, just out of respect for, you know, Coach T. Hawk and Greg, I feel like you guys need to go first because you guys really paved the way for us. So, you know, I'm going to keep my mouth shut until you guys finish. For sure. Man, I'll, okay, I'll get started. But look, it's so so cool to have all y'all and get a chance to look at everybody down here because we you know we're all doing big things. And look, Jermaine gonna say something like that. It's real nice of you. But I tell you, um, I was fortunate when I was in college. I went to school at Grambling State University, and when I was there, I was part of an organization, and we had a chance to go speak at an elementary school. And I just saw these bright faces, and it was an opportunity to just to see how eager they were to learn. And so. I initially knew now from just that feeling I had that I wanted to do something with kids. I didn't at first know what the vehicle would be. So I taught science to uh, middle school, middle school level for four years. 
And but then the vehicle, instead of being in the classroom, became being outside. And, and I made the vehicle tennis and I started doing that full time in Atlanta in 1994 and uh, never looked back. And so I just knew after that experience that I had with the kids that uh, I was going to be around kids and, and worked on developing young people. Yep. Nice, nice. All right. Well, if we're going uh, with seniority, Jermaine, you'll be next. Yeah, so for me, it was, um, I feel like my coaching career really started when I was really young at the age of 14, 15, because we were just always taught to give back, um, you know, and, and help out the younger ones. Um, just remember being at Coach Peterson, um, rest his soul. He would always um, have a kind of a hierarchy and we, he had the chicken fries, the small fries, the big fries. Um, and I just remember him after every session, you know, we, we, it was our duty just to go to the smaller courts and um, give back to those kids and just the next ones that were coming behind us. So he had a great system. And naturally, um, you know, it was a natural transition for me after college um, and trying to tour. I travel with uh, my brother, Jameer Jenkins, a little bit. And, you know, just being on the road with him for a year, um, that was kind of my first hidden partner role, per se. And you know, just learning from other coaches and absorbing the environment when you're out traveling. And after that, um, you know, after playing, and I, I remember being in Pennsylvania, um, working at a club up there, met a nice um, club member, was like, hey, you know, you're too young. You should go after your dream. And so I travel. I was like, okay, you know, I traveled to this tournament in Florida. And mind you, I've been training two months in Pennsylvania, um, really cold. I show up in Florida a week, played a 25K, lost to a guy named Nathan Pasha. And I was like, man, it's time to hang it up. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nathan, I don't know if you remember that tournament, but I think you had a USDA coach with you you were traveling with at the time. Yeah. So, all um, for me, I was like, okay, yeah, you know, the bank rolls getting low. Um, there's no future plan in futures. And, and for me, it, I, it was a natural um, just transition for me just to be around players. Sorry, guys. Phone was ringing. Um, just a natural transition for me to be around players. And um, that was kind of my first, um, you know, that's why I started coaching because I, I didn't want to hang it up and just was just basically a tennis champion. Wow. Full circle. All right. Well, now we're going to hear from uh, Nathan Pasha himself, who I don't know if he if he gave it up for real to start coaching, because Nate, like, me and Nate been talking since last year. That's about funny. Coaching. Yeah, this joker, this joker said, I'm going to I want to get the, all the way into coaching. And then he goes and wins like two or three rounds in the U.S. Open. What do you know? Oh, that's, no, I, I won one round, but but two or three sounds better. But no, I mean. The, <laughs> but the, tell the, us how the, you got into coaching, man. I mean, similar to Tori, what's, what's going on, Tori? Uh, similar to Tori, Greg, um, with Tori, the, the most influential people in my lives have been coaches or teachers in some form, um, all of them. Outside of my mom, it's been coaches. Uh, with Greg, and kind of similar because um, it's just a passion for helping kids, helping people. And I didn't really realize that until there's a couple 12-year-olds I'm working with now, and I realized how much I love it and being a part of their process. Um, but really, it, and it may sound a bit selfish, but it's the easiest way for me to live my values of teaching, connection uh, with people, exercising, and, uh, and and really just teaching people life through tennis because, um, you know, that's how it's been taught to me. So it's really just trying to help every kid take, take every kid as far as they can go. Really, everyone's mission, and it's different for everyone, and it allows me to be creative. And, you know, I've really been doing the same thing since I was nine years old, which is get up, get better and, uh, you know, deal with all the emotion, all the difficult emotions that come with the game and try to uh, help people along the way and, uh, and also do things like this where I can kind of collaborate with, with, with obviously really good tennis minds and keep figuring out ways to help more people. And uh, so, yeah, it's just the easiest way for me to live my values and, and uh, it's just a fun way to live. And, and yeah, I mean, they, they've all kind of been my heroes, the good teachers. You know, because we've all had good ones and bad ones, and, and they have such dramatic impacts on all of our lives. And I just want to be a, a good one on other people. Nice, nice. All right. Yeah. Well, let's get into the tough questions. Let's 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 dig in a little bit. All right. This one's for Coach Greg. But I like right. 
you've had a tremendous success with coaching and creating champions in young girls. Um, what would you say is a key factor in training them if there is one? Real quick, EJ, you was trying to say something? I was, I was. My, my situation was a little different. I, I strongly disliked tennis when I was coming up. Um, and didn't realize how great I was until two years ago. Um, but I knew at 12 years old what I wanted to do. Again, coaches and, and, and teachers, those were my inspirations to give back. Uh, I had a chance to become a substitute teacher for Gwinnett County after college. And I realized that me connecting with kids who are, you know, comparable. Um, and even I wasn't still that old at that time to give back that the, a lot of kids related. And I think, you know, just coming back to a city that showed me so much love and support, I will be cheating the sport if I didn't give back to the sport that was so good to me. And so, uh, you know, just decided to step out on faith and to, and to, to give back as much as I can to the city that showed me love. So uh, definitely Coach Norman Wilkerson, rest his soul, uh, was an influential part of my life. Uh, even though I had both parents in my household, I spent more time with him than my own father. So I learned so much in his time um, before his death. And uh, he kind of knew his path and just, I just soaked everything up like a sponge. And just now I'm trying to emulate the same same position he took uh, when I was coming up, so. All right, beautiful, beautiful. All right, That's and-, awesome. and just to just to reset the room, so it's it's uh today's panel is uh not an open panel, but more so um for the for the invited panelists just to kind of give their feedback, and then we'll have Q and A and and an open discussion towards the end of it, um just to make sure we kind of stay on theme and 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 I have a personal you know agenda of trying to get the kids and some of my parents uh, and the ones who are all joining. Uh, to just to kind of get some tidbits on how to help their kids develop mentally, um, perform better in tournaments, and just to kind of see what we can learn from that process from those who have created champions. Um, so EJ, like, man, love you, bro. Like, we'll give a chance to for everyone else to speak at, towards the end, but right now it's just for the panelists or just for the, the four invited panelists. Sounds good. All right. All right, so uh, the first question is for Coach Greg. Uh, again, You've had a tremendous success with creating champions in young girls. Um, what would you say is a key factor in training them, if there is a, if there is one? Well, you know, that's a good question. I think we're probably not only girls, but I think a player, and we can lean towards the girls so I can stay on task a little bit more, but I think that they need to know that you care about them uh, as a person because I think getting that connection with them to, to, to help them be accountable to the goals that you're going to set because you're going to spend a lot of time with a player. And so, first of all, them knowing how much you care. And, wow. and after that, being able to just help them be accountable to going after certain things and staying on a, on a theme and, and learning how to, to set process and outcome goals. Um, I think that's critical. With, with girls, sometimes you're going to probably have, you know, some some different moves even to deal with, to be honest with you. That's a little different from boys sometimes. And so you have to be prepared each day because you know what? It just may be that way sometimes, but you can still get them where they need to be and help them work towards what they need to work towards. But you you just may have to approach it a little bit differently because, you know, every player is a little bit different. And so just being consistent also, because even though there may be some, some attitude and, and mood swings a little bit as a coach, you being consistent and steadfast about things that you're working on is very important. So I know that that consistency of, uh, of effort and staying towards your goals are, is very important. Sure. And I asked you that specifically about girls um, because I, I, I don't know how it ended up this way, but my academy right now is all girls, 100 percent right gotcha. now. So wow. I was like, I didn't know if there was a different dynamic or, you know, if, 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 you know, and I know you've put more than a few um, young girls in the top 10, I was like, okay, well, you know, there's definitely an emotional aspect and some different challenges or whatnot. So, all right, cool. All right, next I'll ask, uh, well, let's go to Nathan. All right. As a more recent ATP competitor, 
what did you look for in a great coach um, on that level? Or is it different than what you needed on a lower level, if that makes sense? So while playing, at a, while playing on the ATP level, was there something that you looked for in a coach um, when you were playing on that level that was different from when you were, um, say, playing Southerns and national tournaments as a junior? That's a good question. I mean, not, not really. Um, I, I think the best coaches that, that have come to mind that I've had were, were either probably uh, David DeLucia or Dustin Taylor, where I got better under the quickest amount of time. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a lot of the – similar things that Greg said that a lot of those coaches had that I really liked. I mean, that's kind of a general baseline, I think, for, for, for a lot of it. Uh, they had those things, but really they just did a good job of just uh, telling me how to understand situations and, and just my game in particular. Like, things weren't so general. Like, they got really specific. I knew what I was working on and why and where I was in my process. So really coaches that are really good at that, um, and that's kind of hard to find, you know, like that. I've only really had two or three, you know, that have really kind of connected. So I always kind of look for just generally something like that if I could, um, you know, I mean, but that's, that's always been kind of consistent throughout my career. Like whenever I've really had that, uh, I've, I've done pretty well, you know, so it kind of, kind of a combination of that. Good. Okay. Sounds yeah. good. All right. Uh, Jermaine, we're coming your way next. All right. So coaching the Olympic team, uh, working with Naomi Osaka, Coco Golf, and being a part of Venus's um, team at one point, what would you say were two of the most valuable skills um, that made you an asset to those teams? Yeah, I mean, I just, just to echo what Coach Greg was saying, I, I feel like me being a natural introvert, um, I think I was able to just observe um, in my younger coaching years and just being able to kind of read the player a little bit and, you know, just having more of a cooperative coaching style. And I think it's not, you know, what you say is how you say it. So just having that effective communication, I think those are, you know, just two skills that, you know, really sets you apart because, you know, I mean, you could be the best coach in the world or know the most information, but, you know, it's just how you relay that information. Um, you know, like, especially with high level players, because, you know, you want to keep it as simple as possible. You know, it's a lot more coaching going on rather than teaching. So I just believe in simplicity. So, um, yeah. All right. Sounds good. And Coach Tory, all right, coming to you. Um, we all know that you've wor worked with a lot of great players. Um, and I want to come back to the Scoville thing, because um, just personally, I saw a lot of that process. Like I was at Washington Park um, when uh, Sco, right around the time Sco actually just started playing tennis. And I saw him go from this little eight-year-old kid to winning Kalamazoo to playing on TV at the US, um, at the US Open. And I know that you were an intricate part of that um, of, as, as, as his head coach. Um, what were some of the key coaching components that helped you take him from Washington Park to the first rock to the first round main draw of the US Open. What were some of the things that you did intentionally to develop him from a 10, 12 year old kid to, you know, competing on the highest level? Sure. First of all, I need to give much respect for Ernie Peterson for giving him his base. Um, yeah. I didn't have him at eight. I had him at 10. He was about to turn 11. And I have to give all respect to Coach P for what he did. Uh, Coach Peterson, I think, put a stamp on a lot of the young brothers on the south side. Uh, I just happened to uh, – Sco kind of fell in my lap at about between 10 and 11. And I was working with a young man named Nathan Sachs, who uh, I got to win making one year. And Sco Senior came up to me and said, if you can get Sachs that good, I'm – I had, you know, I'm giving you Sco because if you can get him good, you know, I know my kids is, is, is a little bit athlete, you know, you take him as far as you can take him. Um, it's funny that you mentioned it. Uh, and I definitely want to give Ernie his, his props because I feel like Ernie has uh, put a, put the base there. And, and as far as uh, the, just the, some of the ball striking and the setup and the foundation from the ground up was, was there. Um, as a coach of, as Sco's coach in particular, I think one thing that I was during those years, I was trying to outwork and be as smart and work as smart and as hard as anybody out there. I was 
studying, asking questions, reading. I'm still reading, still asking a lot of questions, but at that time, especially, I was doing so much. I was asking Greg, I was asking Turhan, I was asking Jason Parker, other people. And then as I got bigger people, I was, it was Nick Saviano. It was, uh, you know, it was uh, Rodney Harmon. Was, whoever I could ask, they were, that was, that was just a sponge on, hey, help me get this kid to the next level. Katrina did a, did a uh, taught me a, a lot of things uh, when she was here as the national coach those years. Uh, Ricardo Acuna, you name it. I, I asked him, I was putting him through it. Um, so that was it. That was one component. Work harder and smarter than everybody else. Um, I think the other thing that I had that was really, that I really tried to do, I looked at the top of the game. I looked at where the game was. You guys know Sco. He had a, he had a, a good backhand and forehand was a little suspect back in the day and he had great returns with no serves. So I said, okay. You know, um, I looked at some of the top of the game. At that time, it was Agassi and Sampras. And I said, well, he ain't going to have good volleys, so he's going to have to be Agassi. So I said, let's get this kid a serve. Let's get this kid a forehand. And let's get this kid to return. And if in 10 years, 15 years, you know, can I form his game to be a version of Andre now, but better, a little bigger, a little stronger, maybe a little bigger serve, right? And so that was the other thing. I tried to, I tried to look to the top and try to say, okay, let's aim for the top. However far we get is where we get, but let's make sure the site's pretty high as far as that's concerned. Um, the other thing that I feel, and it's kind of funny that a lot of your parents were on this panel, Terrell, is that one thing that Sco Senior told me and very few other parents told me, he said, Tori, get him as good as he, as you can. I said, well, what does that mean? I go, you know, he says, just what it means. Get him as good as you possibly can. Take him as far as he can go. Most parents come at me with, hey, we really like for him to, you know, make nationals or really like for him to play, you know, make Southern one or, or beat so-and-so. They kind of almost come in with the, with the I'm going to say a, uh, you know, almost a level, a key that they need to beat or, or a level they want to get to. Sco Senior didn't give me a level. He gave me permission to take the young man as far as I could. And so at that point, I looked at Sco different. I tried to build him from the ground up. I tried to build him to make everything, make sure everything was solid, as good as I could. And at that point, Sko gave me what, uh, almost a, you know, uh, just a free pass. Say, look, whatever you got, get it, give it to him. He says, he says, whatever that means, you know, you you decide that. And then that was that was the third component. So I have to say, you know, work hard and smart. Uh, look at the top of the game, see where that's at, and make sure your your training's on par with that. Whatever point you get there, uh, or, or or not, but at least you're headed that direction. And the last is parents. We really got to be open when we look at a coach. We're giving that coach the permission to really do what they can and really paint that canvas. You know what I mean? And, and if the coach, you know, you'd be surprised what your coach can do if you really let them hold the reins and take care of some things. And then, uh, as I say, I, I went because now it was on me. You see what I'm saying? Now it was on me. It wasn't on, uh, you know, we coaches, we, 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 we complain about it a lot. We, we could not all oh, parents this, parents that. But when the parent, when the parent gives you the child and says, there, yeah, he's yours, take him, then that puts a lot of responsibility on you as a coach to really try to get that young man or young lady as far as they can because now it's on you. So those, those are three components that I feel are really important going the distance. I, you know, I told school, I even tried to get him to walk out of it. I was like, he's going to lose a lot in the early. He goes, Fine. He goes, if that's what it takes. And so it just kind of kind of gave me this whole thing where I was, you know, I was rethinking the whole how I would get to this kid, this level, uh, literally from about from about two months in when we started for the, the next 10 years. It was, you know, we were it, it was it was one mission, one goal. And, you know, uh, I really appreciate him giving me, giving me the chance. And obviously give, appreciate Sco for sticking with me that long to really uh, get to some uncharted territory for both of us. Nice. Okay. Well, you kind of um, open the door. So I, I, I go next to this question and this is open. Anyone can um, anyone on the panel can jump in developmentally. What is the first thing that you want to equip your students with or that you check for to see if they have? For when me, it's an under. Go ahead. I, I was going to say when you're developing um, a student or like you have that buy in from the parents. What are what, what is the first or some of the first things that you either check for to see if they have or you try to equip them with? Uh, the, the first thing is hand skills to get the ball up and down. And the second thing is to be able to get the feet in position um, and line the outside leg up behind the ball, really. I mean, those are the two things. And, and then for me, reading the ball comes after that. But it takes such a long time to own hand skills and own proper foot positioning. And that really starts to seeing the ball really well. Like, I, like I, I just feel like I really start with hand skills a lot first. And then it's kind of a combination of reading the ball and, and footwork. 
those are kind of the same thing in my mind but like i really don't leave those two areas for for a, especially if they're it depends on their level too but I, i'm just thinking basic you know so when i'm thinking i i really hit those two areas and as far as i'm concerned if we don't have those two areas there's not much else to talk about so um that's just where i'm at with those two and when you say when you say hand skills i just want to be um clear so is that more feel or is that more coordination it's the ability to feel like really you're you're the, the ability to hit top spin to swing fast and still get control on the ball, um, the ability to grab the ball, uh, the ability to, to, to you can act you, your bottom level is high because you can hit an aggressive safe ball and you're not relying on just flat skimming over the net to win a match or a tournament throughout the year. Um, you know, we're going to get excited about that for a week or a few days, but it's not going to go well for the rest of the year. So it, it's really more so a, a certain feel of being able to accelerate and still keep the ball in. And I'm always trying to find new ways to develop hand skills because because people have some really cool ideas on on how to develop it. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Uh, I'll take I'll go next. I think for me, um, just strictly having a niche with the women's side, I think, um, as Nate calls uh, hand skills for me, is like the continental grip skills. Um, you know, because there's a direct proportion with how much money you make um, in your later years playing tennis if you're able to transition, you know, transition forward. Oh, cool. You don't have those limitations. And um, outside of that, um, I agree with Nate. I would say movement. I mean, movement's really important. And some things you can't teach. I mean, you're going to have some athletes who, you know, that are just not fast twitch, you know, um, but just efficiency, um, you know, just being in the right place, taking the right angles at the ball, um, yeah, those two things I feel like are highly important. And if I could, could jump in there, I think a, a lot of something that you mentioned as far as like having the right angle, um, as far as footwork is concerned, I don't hear a lot of coaches and this is none of my business. They can say what they want to, they can coach how they want to coach, but a lot of kids, um, I, I don't see many of them, um, valuing the right posture as far as like having your, your feet lined up a certain way to make a certain shot. They rely more on, well, I'll just catch it a little bit early to pull it wide, but it's a lot easier if your feet are set to rotate wide as opposed to trying to manipulate the racket face. And, you know what I mean? Like they both work, but it's a whole lot easier when it's feet first. Got that one from TH. All right, anybody else want to jump on that question? Well, I think they've, they've covered it pretty well, but I think that uh, just, you know, with movement, having balance, having a level of agility, that, that stuff is very important, right? Because you want to get to the ball with balance and, and then just having to, again, like I've heard the, the hand skills, you know, can you, can you, you know, cover the ball and shape it like you want to, you know, those things are what you're looking for early on. And really is the kid adjusting some on their own without being told exactly what to do every moment? That's what I look for. Can you be creative and, 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 and do your thing without me telling you everything to do? That's something I look for early on because that's important. Super key. That's super key, yeah. I think that's one of the biggest. The guys, uh, Posh and, and Jay, hit it on the on nail in the head as far as developmentally speaking. Uh, I think, Greg, that's one of the biggest things I look for. How how a, a guy, a, one of my old bosses in the fire department told me this. He said, sharp people do sharp things. And I, I never forgot that. If I can tell you one time, you get it one time. And the first time I tell you, and we can move on. Imagine how many more things we can get to in that hour lesson. If right. I tell you once, I have to tell you a third time. I got to tell you the fifth time. We're, we're repeating stuff. At some point, I'm having to go back and reteach when that same kid I'm have in the next hour or next week can get that done a whole lot simpler, a whole lot sooner. You know, you're just going to run out of time. I mean, you're going to be a good player eventually, but at, at, at what cost and at what time, you know, you're just not going to be able to get there. Can you do it? Can you get it quicker? Can you just, and that way there's more to move on to and you'll develop in shorter, in shorter period of time. Sure. For sure. All right. Uh, another open-ended question or open for, um, for the panel. So, over the years, all of you all have seen and worked with a lot of players, right, on, on various levels. But right now, I want to kind of focus on um, performance at the higher levels, at least Southern National ITF level. Um, who, uh, I, I'll come back to that question. But what do you look for in the kids that have been more successful? Um, 
what was like a telltale sign um, when you first started working with them that they're probably um, going to go pretty far, or be pretty good? So well, look, me, I, if I, you're going to start your area, we go. Real quick, because I'm going to mention somebody that, with, that everybody knows and I didn't work with, uh, but he played doubles with Sko at uh, the Australian doubles. And I'm going to mention something here that I think is very underrated. Uh, Novak Djokovic played doubles with Sko. They got to the semis of, us, of Australian back in whatever that was, early 2000s. Um, Novak was the scrawniest, shortest, uh, no forehand, no serve, couldn't volley to save his life. Uh, kid I saw, I saw out there on the ITF. Um, in the semis, if you guys remember, Gail Monfils was one of the top juniors in the world at that time. He had, in fact, he would go on to win uh, the Australian Open junior that year. He actually won three of the four and was probably on, on slotted to win the whole Grand Slam for the juniors while he was getting the top 150, 200, whatever his first year. I come to Novak on this one, uh, T.O., because when you talk about what some things you look for, sometimes it's also what you don't see. Novak was hanging with everybody there and had no weapon. The back end was always pretty tight. I mean, it was just clean and the turns were always really good. But when I tell you, they, he was hanging with everybody, got to the semis of the, of the, of the singles and singles and singles of the doves. It was his last, you know, ITF. And we were, you know, I was asking, hey, Mo, what time are you going to next? You're going to play French? You're going to play? He goes, oh, no, that's my last one. I'm, 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 I'm going pro. And I'm looking at this fool like, going pro, huh? <laughs> I'm like, you want pro with that serve and with, with no volleys and no forehand. I'm like, mm. I'm like, buddy, you know, okay, okay, good luck to you, you know. Well, but he was hanging with what he had, grinding out points, not missing many balls. He hadn't really hit his growth spurt yet. He was still about 16, 17. And I say that to, to, to a lot of his parents as well as a lot of us other coaches is, is look for what you don't see. Well, Novak would go on to get a bigger, a bigger serve. Novak would go on to get a little bit bigger forehand, right? And now, well, aside from his drama in Australia, we all understand that the guy's pretty much mastered and maxed out a lot of his talent. He's arguably one of the best to ever play the game. And that wasn't the case just 15 short years ago. He was literally, uh, in my opinion, I would have said he was underdeveloped. Now I say that to say, look for what you don't see. I was at a, another uh, conference a few years back, a black coaches panel uh, at, for the USDA. And we were all looking at some footage of Francis and everybody was talking about, oh, it's technique. Oh, look at that. And I'm like, and I'm saying thing. I'm like, you know what? I've seen some of this before, but what you don't see is under the hood. You know, the heart of that kid was just, just off the charts. You know, he can, he can keep getting that technique a little more developed, get a little more fine tuned, but you cannot, uh, as they say, you can measure the size of the dog, but in the fight, but you can't measure the size of fighting the dog. And so those are a couple of things that I would, just make sure coaches and parents both really groom and really bring out. Uh, and, and sometimes I feel like we, we're a little quick to be critical uh, instead of seeing, hey, this kid wants to be good. I mean, like really good. And just kind of max that passion. You don't know what the next six months, year, two years could do to a kid's development, to his growth, um, especially speaking for some of the boys. I mean, they just, it's, you, you just don't know. And two or three years, I remember I remember when Posh was, it was a little bitty thing, you know, it was all, and, and Eubanks too, just as, as, as skinny and strong as it could be and the kid, but he always had good volleys. And I look at him now, he's still got great volleys. And of course he gotten more certain volleys all his years at Georgia. You just see those kind of things and you start realizing, you know, kids going to want to get better. I, I won't over talk it, but my point is look for what you don't see and look for some of the things that the kid might still be hanging with what he's got when he gets a weapon. Look out. Good, good. Anybody else want to jump on that? No, I think, well said, Tori. Well, <laughs> Mr. Right. Jermaine. Yeah, I think you covered it all. I mean, for me, it was more about, you know, like the dog in the fight, like you said, and just, you know, can you take a punch? You know, um, can you take a punch? Do you have that mindset of, you know, I'm going to be here. This is a five, 10 year, 15 year project. So, yeah, you hit it, hit the nail on the head. And I, no, I think some, most definitely something that something that I heard that kind of stood out to me, uh, what you just said, Jermaine, was about uh, being, can you take a punch? And uh, that may roll into our next question um, as far as like performance anxiety. So like a lot of uh, a, a lot of kids, um, you know, you take a tough loss or you lose to 
that's the thing now, a lower UTR or um, a player that uh, you lose a match that you feel like was a very winnable match, um, but you take an L and some kids don't know how to bounce back from, forget the match, one or two tough points, um, a, a break a serve, you lost a set. Um, what would you all say to a player um, with kind of certain match anxiety or just kind of getting too much in their own head to overcome or get over that mountain of, all right, I lost this, but, or this person, they just had a really tough hold and they, and they consolidated the break. How do I bounce back? What is the mindset of a champion or, or, or what would you say as the, as their coach to say, this is how we're going to bounce back from that and rebound? Uh, you want me to take this one? You, um, sure. Anyone yeah, can jump. I, mean, I, I think it's more of a two way street. I think, you know, first of all, just to address the whole UTR thing, I, cause I, I mean, that one right there, that's a whole nother conversation, but you know, yeah. like you know, when you're out playing and you're playing a high level, nobody's worried about a UTR out here. You know, like I think maybe for college recruiting, um, you know, if the kid's going to take that pathway, I think that's really important. Um, but, you know, we're talking about, you know, being, you know, top 100 in the world. I don't think that Novak's checking this UTR, you know. And I would right. say, what would you tell a player who has match anxiety, play more matches? Um, you know, like if you, when you start with your schedule and you start with your developmental plan, you're thinking like, okay, I'm playing, you know, X amount of tournaments. I'm playing 20, 25 tournaments. Like, I mean, you can't sweat it. Like you go to the next stop, you, you get better. You try to get a little bit better each day. But, you know, if you're playing one match every three or four months, then, you know, I would have anxiety too. That'd give me anxiety. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, but again, what does that look like on a daily basis too? Like, you know, if you're getting an hour of technical work, you know, maybe you're getting an hour and a half, two hours of drilling. But, you know, a part of your portion of your day should be playing a set, at least minimum, you know. Like, you know, I think it's a lot maybe easier on the guy side because, you know, a hit is a hit, a set is a set. Um, but sometimes, you know, on the women's side, you know, it's like, oh, I don't really like her. So, you know, I'm not going to cooperate in this drill. I'm not going to, you know, maybe get a ball, you know, so it gets a little, you know, dicey sometimes, but, um, you know, but just play more sets, play, play more matches, you know, then that anxiety will go down, but then we can start talking about tactics and, you know, you could do more coaching, um, instead of spending all your time teaching. Yeah. I think, I think it's also very important to like in playing those matches, you gain invaluable experience and reference points. So like, um, I remember my very, very, very short stint um playing futures and, and and all that kind of stuff um I, I we were talking about this earlier I would lose like every match six four and a third and it was because every time I got to that turning point in the match I didn't know what to do I, it was every every opportunity was like figure it out now what do I do either this is going to work or it's not going to work but after you've played a certain amount of matches you're not figuring it out anymore it's oh yeah I remember last time I was here this is what you do in that situation Okay, backhand out wide, you serve in volley. I don't know, uh, to put some pressure on, you don't even plan on hitting a volley, but you know they're tight, they're as tight as you are. And because you've, you have those reference points, some stuff, it just works because you've done it enough time to know, uh, to, to gain confidence in it. Um, and, I, and I throw this out here, we've talked about it a couple of times before. I just, it's, it's a neat dynamic. So, um, Jermaine specifically. So I remember uh, you and I grew up pretty much. We were same age, same middle school, same high school, known each other since we were like knee high to a duck. And I'll never forget, like, I, I felt like we were neck and neck until like that transition from middle school to high school. And it was like, dude pulled away. Like we, we after the summertime, it went from um, neck and neck. I think I went further in you than like the, the little middle school tournament or something like that. I come back and I'm thinking, all right, cool. This is my peer. This dude is number one in the state, number one in the South, top 30 in the country. And it's like, man, I, I couldn't figure out like what happened differently. And I don't think it, I don't think it had much to do with ability. Um, but I think it had everything to do with match experience and just gaining more like um, experience. But it, I'll let you speak from there because it's your story. I, I just know it from the outside looking in. Yeah, I think, um, honestly, I got to give a lot of props to T. Hawk on this one, too, because I remember just being in my, you know, I went to all black, you know, middle school, high school. And, 
you know, we play basketball. So I, I remember going to UTA up north. I went there maybe a couple of days a week to train, but I was more interested in playing basketball. I was like, okay, we can get through this tennis practice, but I'm going to the, the basketball court. And I right. just remember being on the basketball court and um, T-Hawk saying, hey, look, you know, I play b-ball, you know, you're going to compete against guys like me. Don't look like you're going to be that tall, um, you know, but, you know, with this tennis thing, get you a good scholarship, um, you're athletic, um, you know, you're going to be competing with, you know, you can compete, you know, like you'll be superior in that sport versus, you know, so he talked me out of really trying out for my high school basketball team. And so that's where, for me, that was one of the turning points to where, you know, I started to take tennis a little bit more serious and um, being more committed and dedicated. Um, but yeah. Fair enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chime in on that one because I remember that conversation. You remember that day, T-Hawk? I, I remember that day, sporting club over there on the basketball courts, Jay. You know, I'll never forget it. I told Jermaine that he could be All-American in, in tennis, and I didn't think he'd be All-American in basketball. And what he didn't know was I had a cousin that played at Duke and uh, played football at Duke. And I saw Grant Hill when I was playing college ball, and Grant Hill was my position at 6'8", and I was playing backup center at 6'6". And here's Jermaine, not even six feet yet. And I'm like, bro, trust me, <laughs> I'm short. You don't even know. I'm short, like for real. And so he was like, anyway, we talked. I'm just laughing at the conversation because uh, I knew it was good. But what I want to point out, though, Jermaine wanted to be good in something. And Jermaine had a passion to be good. I'm just happy he listened to me and channeled that energy toward, toward tennis. He'd have been a good basketball player. You know what I mean? He'd, he'd have played ball somewhere. There's no question. He's a too good athlete, too competitive. Just happy he took it towards tennis. And I think that's what I was getting at is that that size of that fight in the dog. The, um, you know, he listened and I thought it was two days later, he came up to me and said, do you really think I could be that good in tennis? It showed me that he listened. It showed me that he really wanted it. And I said, yeah, I really believe that. And you know, out of how small the world is, my college coach ended up being his college coach at, at, uh, at Clemson and kind of a uh, kind of kind of kind of funny story in the jet. You know what I mean? But I wanted, I wanted to put that out there that that's some of the things that, well, that that can happen, and, and again, I couldn't couldn't have been a, a more proud moment for me when I when I saw the All American uh, next to his name. You know, what I mean, we, it's a it's a it's a smile me and Jay have shared over the years. That uh, you know, and again, it was uh, it was just a just a, a neat moment. Yeah, full circle, full circle. Oh, that's that's awesome. I I didn't know that background story. Thanks for sharing that. I want to say something real quick because for some of the younger players who are still developing, you know, they have to play tournaments to compete while they're working on technique and working on footwork and all these things are happening at the same time. I think it's very important as you approach the tournament, let's just say they're going to start on Friday. On, by Wednesday, they have a theme. The player has a theme. And that's how they're going to play the match. And so if we agree every first serve return goes through the middle, if we agree that you're going to hit 70% forehands, 30% backhands which means you're trying to get more forehands right and so if you're doing if you follow your theme whether you win or lose the match you are successful for this event and so I think being coachable and understanding that you're developing through these tournaments at the same time you have to compete so I think to give them something to focus on we all want to win you know who does not want to win so I don't have to talk about that I'm talking about I want you to do this I want you to do that and it, a lot of times, right, if, if they can follow their theme successfully, it equals to a victory anyway. So it goes together, by the way. <laughs> I mean, I, Terrell, I, I, though, like. Go ahead. You go ahead. I, 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 think, I think part of pressure also, I mean, it's just realizing that, uh, I mean, like pressure is a part of life. Sometimes I think people try to avoid, how, how do I not feel pressure? Just be so confident to where you don't feel pressure. Like, this is my first time in the real world since April and getting off tour, like, it's pressure out here being in the real world. And, you know, like, I, I like, I, I like to teach um, life, like through the game, like, like learn how to absorb and deal with pressure. Stop trying to run from it. Like, yes, it's uncomfortable. It's okay. Absorb it. Can you make that a lifestyle? You know, like how many competitive situations can I put you in to where you just work on absorbing pressure and enjoying it? Don't you feel alive? Like kind of a th more, more just really trying to change its perception and things like that. And then also look, I mean, we're playing tennis at the end of the day. Nobody's going to die. I mean, and at the end of the day, I mean, even if we put all, you know, our all in developing people, I mean, really, 
maybe one person is going to make it like everyone else is probably going to go on to have great life skills and be great people and maybe they'll make it but that's the real goal in it all and and i i kind of think uh when that perception is there um i i see people handle pressure better in terms of my friends in terms of me uh and all of that stuff you know the, the but the biggest thing is like look you're just playing a game you know like people are out here dying and stuff like that first of all you're playing a game second of all yeah, like it's okay to admit you're nervous and you feel pressure. It's normal. It's a normal human response. You just deal with it. You absorb it, you know. So that that's at least how I see it. And, yes, playing matches and all that stuff, when you play matches, you get to practice those things. But when you're in those matches, it's really just looking for pressure in any kind of lifestyle situation and and and, and trying to own it and, and realizing it doesn't get any easier. Your heart's going to beat fast every single time. And, you know, can you slow it up, you know. So I, I think that's a lifestyle. Or so, for sure. I think that's a dope perspective. And uh, what I was gonna say, I like to, I like to look at it like a video game. Like it is a game, but like a video game, nobody feels like they're going to have a, a conniption or you know th that same kind of anxiety when you're playing, you know, Madden or 2K or Call of Duty or whatever. It's like, oh, I died. Okay, learn the right. skill that'll help me succeed and live longer. Or right. oh man, I got beat. All right, well. Let me go back and go back to the practice or to the tutorials, learn a little bit more, and then go back to compete online. And then when I, you know, get your chops up, you start fighting, you start battling more, you start hanging a little bit longer, and that experience comes in play because not only am I not really focusing on winning or losing, I'm focusing on the tactic that is going to win or lose for me. Right, So right. Dope. All right. All right, well, um, I got a lightning round for you, fellas. Uh, well, I asked one more open-ended question, and then I got a lightning round um, that's like an either-or, would-you-rather type situation. So before I get into that, my last question is um, fill in the blank, and I'd like all four of you all to kind of figure this one or, or tell me what you think. It is impossible to win without blank. <laughs> without loving to suffer? Without, <laughs> without, <laughs> without, what? without enjoying suffering. Without, I mean, kind of going back to the dog thing, like you're not going to win if you don't enjoy to suffer. Like, that's, like that's number one. Yeah. Yeah, you have to be competitive. You got to be you got to be a heck of a competitive player for sure. It's individual. So you better be ready to compete. I would add to that love of the game, uh, even when you lose, especially when you lose, uh, just the love of the game uh, uh, and just the passion for it, for getting better. You know, it's if you don't have that, if you don't have that love of it you won't do it when you when you don't want to you won't do it when you have a bad day you won't stay out there long uh passion for it and, and a love for it again win or lose you're just gonna keep getting better and you know uh that you love it that much when that happens um i chose team a solid team uh you need a solid support system um you know this this sport's way too hard to do it on your own so uh for me it was a little bit more of um yeah just there's nothing, nothing you can accomplish in this sport without a solid team. You need a fitness trainer, you need a coach, or you need a, you know, you need a sponsor, or maybe you don't need a sponsor, but you know, you need a mental coach. There's just so many different buckets to be, uh, to be filled. Just to, when you see Novak or if you see a Serena, there's so many people behind the scenes. All right, all right, good, good deal, good, all, all great answers. I'm, I'm taking notes as well. All right, so um, this is my lightning round before we get to the Q&A and um, everyone will have a chance to ask your questions. So if you want, go ahead and put your questions in the chat and then um, we'll pull them up and, and, and have, them, um, have them answered uh, when we get to that segment. All right, so here's a lightning round. Um, tell me your preference and why. All right, live ball drills or dead ball drills? Depends on the situation. I mean, but uh, I guess live ball. <laughs> we got to go with that live. live you know, we gotta go <laughs> I guess live. We got to go live. Who's about live to say ball. ball. My arm's tired of feeding so ball. many balls. I want a live ball. <laughs> live ball it is. All right. Next question. Ooh. feel like this would be old school versus new school. Open stance versus closed stance. Both. And I don't mm. like the word closed. Situational. I'd say situational and both. Learn both. Learn them early. Situational. Love it. Love okay. it. Love it. Definitely situational. And uh, closed stance gets mixed up with square stance. So I'm going to go with the yeah. square, um, not the close. Fair enough. And, 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 and would, you, would you say that closed or what's considered closed is just more so a focus on the weight transfer? 
and and a result of time, positioning and time. I think it's I think every ball, you know, your your goal is is to is to uh, attack, absorb, counter. You know, uh, depending on what you need, what you got. And I think it's just a matter of. Uh, of what you have at that time. You know, I think the more we get away from talking about the stances and get the kid uh-huh. balanced and being able to return fire, the yeah. better that is. Yeah. I think the more we keep working on the footwork, I taught footwork for years and now I just talk about more balance and, you know. Can, and, can, and kids be thinking themselves into a hole. You keep talking yeah. about the word yeah. too much. <laughs> kids get confused. <laughs> right, that's true. Never just say balance. All right, next question. Um, oh. Technical work or tactical work? Both. Um, ages. Right, is- come on, y'all can't play the whole I think, thing. I, 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 would say, I, 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 I would say. I would say. I would say. I think tactical definitely brings you further quicker. You know, I. I, I just think. You know, like like I, I see people with messed up technique do really well. You know, all the time. So like, and yeah, so I, I think if, if if you hit the tactical, you can maybe get a, a decent amount of results. I mean, it all depends on the kid. I mean, that's why it's both. I feel. <laughs> it all depends on the kid. Pick it a really side, does. pick a side, fellas. Pick a side. I mean, I think it, it's more of a situation <laughs> as a first of ages, What's you up? know. Like if you're teaching a five-year-old tactics, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like if he understands that, sure. he probably wants more, you know. Yeah. We're, talking, we're yeah. talking competitive level, competitive level, at least tactics southern and national tactics. level and beyond. I mean, okay, well, when you're doing this to eat, I mean, you've got to talk a little bit more tactics because if you're still talking to <laughs> you gotta hit that you know? ball across. <laughs> sure. yeah. right. Hit that ball across. <laughs> oh. Yeah, uh, tactical. Yeah. If you're breaking it down like that, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, and 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 I, I I thought that those are interesting um, question or dynamic to me because um, you have players, or I I I have one specifically who is good enough tactically to get to the bigger tournaments like the Orange Bowls or the Eddie Hers or the you know the Nationals or what Super Nationals or whatnot, but because of a technical deficiency. Um, the results are limited. And so it's like, okay, well, do you teach them um, how to win in spite of their deficiency or do you focus on fixing the flaw? You get what I'm saying? Like we all know uh, from back in the nineties, we, we aging ourselves, but you got like a Pete Sampras who had virtually no backhand, but he, he won like before Federer, he was all time grand slam champ. So, you know what I mean? So is it, I just wanted to get the perspective of like, okay, well, do we, teach around it or, or even like th mentioned like skull didn't volley but he still did what he still accomplished what he accomplished you know what i mean so do you coach around it find a tactic that suits your skill set or do we improve the skill set uh, think- funny little story about pete sampras he had a two-handed backhand and was no more in the country in 14s his mm. coach changed him to a one-handed backhand one of the allow him on his, birth, on his first serve and he gave him a one-hander so he quit hitting his two-hander. <laughs> and the kid made Kalamazoo as a first-year 16. Mind wow. you, lost first and first, uh, but ended up, as we all know it, two years later was hitting partner for the Davis Cup. And we all know Pete Sampras after that and won his first U.S. Open, whatever it was, 1990, I guess it was. But I say that to say the kid wasn't a bad two-hander. Maybe he would have never become Pete Sampras had he have stayed with uh, the two-hander. So it's not like he didn't have one. And Clearly, his backhand was not his favorite shot, and he'd bait you into that running four and every single time. The point I'm getting at is, is that his coach, Pete Fisher, wanted him to hit more forehands. He wanted him coming forward. He didn't want him trading balls. And so I, I, to your point that your kid in the Orange Bowl, get him through the Orange Bowl with whatever technique they got. As soon as you come back from the Orange Bowl, you realize they ain't going to make it past first, second round of the Orange Bowl again unless you fix that technique. You fix that technique. We put off tournaments for three or four months, however long it takes. The quicker they learn, the shorter your time out in the, so to speak, in the in, in the pit. Get them back on the track as soon as you can, as soon as they're ready. Play some small tournaments, play a few more before you put it, put as much hot sauce on that ball as you can, and be able to uh, uh, stress it, you know, to the point you know it'll hold up. And that way, next year's Orange Bowl and hopefully beyond, we're ready. So I think that's I totally get your point. I still say both because depending on where the cat's at, they're gonna need that. Clearly, if they got some limiting factor like technical that just keeps breaking down, I mean, you, you've you, you already you've seen this you've seen this story a thousand times. You know, you know, I know. If the, the the kids' moms know, no, oh, you better go to that, you better go to that side over there. I mean, it's just it's not even a, it's not even hard to you know it ain't hard at that point. You got you got to fix it. Yep. yep. All right. Next question. Um, which would you which which do you prefer, 
training for hard or training for clay court tournaments? Or training on hard court or training on clay court? I prefer training on clay. I think the kids learn better. They they just hit more balls. They get they get more everything. They get more footwork involved. They get more coverage of the court. They they develop points better. I think hard court tends to reward the big slap and the big serve, uh, and it's good uh, to have that. But I also feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of development that's lost in that uh, if they only if they only do that. So I prefer clay. I think a lot of our American kids who don't do as much on the clay would benefit more from the clay. Um, and the, I'd say opposite for a lot of kids who grow up in Europe that only grow up on the clay, they need a little more hard. So I, I think a nice mix of both is a good thing for our kids, especially black kids that grow up pretty much on hard courts and in parks. We never even see clay. I mean, get us on clay as soon as you can so we can start kind of understanding our movement and our timing. We we almost suffer sometimes I've seen from overrunning balls and, uh, and just being all over the place. So the clay teaches you when to run into a ball, when to get space and when to decelerate, play the next shot ahead. Uh, and the clay is just, you just, it teaches you in ways you can't, you can't hear. You have to, you have to just feel and, and, and figure out. And I think that's the, uh, we have a deficiency, I feel, uh, especially here uh, with, with some of our kids uh, that don't have it exposed to them early enough. We have a deficiency in the clay. So I think the clay is way more beneficial. Okay. Yeah, the clay for sure is for it's just also, you know, you know, you just get a chance to, it's easier to transition from training on clay to go play a hardcore tournament. But if you're only on hardcore tournament, um, practicing all the time on hardcore and you have to go play on a clay court, you're going to be falling everywhere and you're not going to be used to it. And it just gives you a chance to work on your, your dynamic movements and, and your, your balance getting better. Your, your legs are going to get stronger because you got to fight a little bit more to have balance. And so it's a lot of athletic development that I think could happen a little bit faster too if you're able to get in that dirt a little bit more. Okay. Anybody else? No, I think they said it all. I mean, it just I'm the same. The same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even all right. Though next question. Easier on the body. Which do you prefer, singles or dubs? Are you talking about right now, today? <laughs> I think right now, I think at, at the mileage on all of our knees, we would say dubs. I mean, yeah, but I mean, you won't let me break the singles anymore. True. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, but, yeah, but which, 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 which do you, which do you prefer or um, prefer to coach for? We'll, we'll, we'll say it like I mean, that. Honestly, for me, for a personal experience, um, speaking as an NCAA athlete, I definitely say singles. Um, when I, when I went to college, I felt like my singles game really took a downhill jump just because we did doubles drills until we were like blue in the face. Mm. So, uh, for me, it's definitely singles. Um, the more you can play singles, I think it's just, you know, just you and you out there. Um, also, that's a life skill, problem solving and figuring things out. I mean, doubles is more fun and teamwork. But, you know, if you're really doing this at a very high level, um, you know, got to be a good singles player. The, the, yeah, I mean, singles they're, they're both, sure. I mean, there's such, I mean, and I know you kind of hate this answer, but like there's such two kind of different games. Like if I went, if I was younger and if I went to play singles after playing two or three years of doubles on tour, I'd definitely play singles a little bit differently, you know? So, I mean, like they, they both emphasize such different good things that can complement one another. Uh, but I mean, but everyone watches singles, so singles for sure. Okay. And, 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 and to be clear, I'm asking which do you which do you enjoy coaching more, or which do you Probably prefer singles. coaching coaching sing, coaching four singles or coaching four doubles? It's 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 a tie, but if I have to get if I have to pick the tie, I'd say singles. yeah, yeah, singles. pick a side, man. Okay, all right, singles. I, I, I... All right, uh, all right. As a coach, when you are coaching a practice. Which side are you on? The stop the point and make a and, and 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 stop the point, or we'll talk about it later when it comes to corrections. Like if 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 your if your players are in the middle of a drill or playing a practice match, and you see something that you've been working on that they do, do you stop the point and then address it immediately, or do you let them finish and then you address it in a post game? Yeah. Like post drill or whatever. You got some great uh, either ors here, To, but I'm going to tell yeah. you from my years of, of of doing this, I typically every week did a theme of a pattern of a, whatever the skill was we're doing. 
Monday, I'm stopping the point. Tuesday, we're going to uh-huh. play more. Wednesday, you know, we're, we're getting more full speed. We're adding a serve with it. We haven't already. Thursday, we ain't stopping nothing. You know what I mean? And Friday, we may come back to it and just do a little bit of, uh, of you know, almost a version of it at, at a high level and, and stop and maybe even feed a few balls to finish up and get ready for the tournament. But to your point, I ain't stopping nothing on point play day, which is whatever that day is, Wednesday, Thursday, because they need to play through that and figure it out. But I can't expect you to know what to do yet on Monday. And so it's one of those things where I, if I take it through that progression, you know what I mean? Privates are different because obviously depending on what I'm working on, you know what I mean? If I got a hitter play, hitting in, if, if live balls what they're working on, again, I want to emphasize that thing. But I think it all happens to be the player. But also where are we in the scheme and in, 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 the, in, the, in the periodization? Is the tournament coming up this weekend? You know, and we on Thursday, we, 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 we're going to talk about that later. You know what I mean? If we're on Monday, three weeks away, you know, we're going to, we're going to stop. We're going to feed a little extra. We're going to make sure we got it down and, and, and really going to bring it in a time or two to really talk about it. And let's not forget what we're working on here, you know, because come the end of that week, we ain't got that kind of time. So, so I'm going to skip every Monday and come every Thursday. I'm just letting <laughs> you know right now. <laughs> right? Oh, that's man, the one that, that the that, kids going to enjoy. The <laughs> okay, you, were good enough, you were good enough, Posh. You were good enough to do it's that. It's ready on Monday. <laughs> Posh, if oh. you were on first volley, you already good. You might come back on Thursday. I, I had kids. <laughs> there he is. I, I, something All I've right. enjoyed re- so Something I've enjoyed recently, because a lot of this stuff is, uh, like, decently new as well, is, like, I like to throw a piece of information out there and just watch how kids adjust over the course of like three and four minutes. And, and, and a lot of times I just noticed that that's kind of really all I have to do and just guide them through that process as opposed to just like shifting them in a bunch of different directions and stopping all the time, you know, uh, like it really is cool when I get to watch them work through their own process a little bit. And I can only really do it if the kid has good intention and he understands what he's doing, obviously, but like, uh, I, I lean on the side of just throwing a piece of information out there and just watching him go through his adjustment period, whether that be two minutes, five minutes, whatever it is. Yeah. And it's so satisfying too, when they get it like that, when they can just take the information and like, once you make sure that they understand it, they apply it and execute right. it. And it's like, okay, we can move on. I, I, and I'm not even saying they, they even catch it. And, I mean, because they might not even catch it. Like, I mean, it, it just might be that I can tell they're getting the intent and they're trying. You know, I mean, I, I feel like they rarely, yeah, I don't know, I don't know about catching it. <laughs> yeah, like not truly catching it. Like maybe you'll yeah, catch it for yeah. five minutes. Yeah, yeah, I can't get a, catch a rhythm. Yeah, for me, picking back what um, T Hawk said too, I mean, we use a lot of video as well. Um, you know, okay. so we videotape in pretty much every practice session. So depending on how well the player knows their identity, you know, um, you're probably going to, you know, you're not going to stop and, you know, stop him as much, you'll probably go it's like, hey, at this moment, you know, you did this when you're going back playing over the video. Um, but I think in the earlier stages when you are coaching somebody, you know, you may have to stop. Um, but I know at the higher levels too, you know, if you're on the road doing a practice set, like the other girl's going to look at you crazy. You know, <laughs> oh, yeah. If you keep stopping. So, just, <laughs> yep. see, those That's are true. things that you don't think about until you get to that level, man. You, right. you, you just don't right. know. Thanks for, no, thanks for saving me the embarrassment. <laughs> I like what, you know, you was talking about Toy too, with just kind of, you know, each day could be a little bit different. Because so his Monday, cool. on, on your Monday, like what Toy's talking about, I may be saying something during the point. I mean, it's like that should have been a forehand or return through the middle, you know, and then later in the week, I, I've stepped back and may not be saying that much, but I may be talking to be honest with you, doing the point. I don't care. It's like, I'm trying to get my point across. You're not doing it, you know, so I'm trying to get that point across. It may be during the point, you know? <laughs> Often it's during the point. And, and, to, and to Pasha's po- uh, point also, and, and Jay's both, at the high college level, I mean, you got two days to practice. You got two matches coming the next weekend. I mean, you you're literally cramming a lot of practice in inside of a week's time, and really rare that you get that kind of a, a practice sometimes because you're almost playing more than you're practicing. And then I feel like at the pro level, but I remember I've been on the tour. I had better have a ball ready when that ball missed. I mean, I, wherever I was, I had three balls in my hand at all times and was ready to feed the next ball and make eye contact with the other coach. And one of us had a ball ready, and I had to hit my best, cleanest, hardest speed right in the strike zone. <laughs> Buddy, don't you dare mess up. If that, if I got to turn around to look to see if the feed's coming, you're too late. 
So, mm -hmm. I mean, trust me, I know that part as well, too. So at that level, buddy, trust me, you're not, you ain't stopping nothing. I mean, I, I've seen guys warm up for seven to eight minutes and then want to play a set and cram it all inside of four or five minutes. I mean, you ain't, you ain't got time to say two words. You know, they're taking a water break one time in that 45 minutes. And that, that's, that's a clean practice right there. You ain't offering many words, ain't talking a whole lot. You just, you, you're just watching and just hoping your player can hang in there and, and, and maximize the time frame. But to my point, coming on down to the, to the green ball, to the, you know, to the 12s, yeah. to, uh, you know, to old, uh, you know, uh, uh, Hudlow number seven, you know what I mean? Uh, we'll be back when we had to play those small tournaments over there. Hey, you, you got to you got to make sure the kid can be at that level, you know, first before you start, you know, deciding if it's an either or thing. So anyway, all right. Looking and forward sure. to comments, To all right, you said what now? I'm looking forward to some of these parents. What, what's it? What's in the chat? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Okay. Um... Let we only got one question so far. So just a quick reminder, I'm going to ask this last question uh, for either or, and then we're looking at the time. No, no, no. We'll go ahead and get to that now. All right. So I got one question um, and it is, well, I got two questions. All right. So what would be your advice on using college to develop prior to going pro? That's a Jay and Pasha question right there. They're, they're more recent. Uh, Tarrell, can we can we talk more spe specific? So I know we, yeah, you know, yeah. Say, say, say that one more time. Uh, so, so what, what would be what would be your advice to a parent whose ultimate goal, the parent and player whose ultimate goal is professional, but they are using uh, college as kind of like a um, you know kind of a testing ground? Like think James Blake, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. or or even Eubanks. Like okay, well we know we have the ability to get there, but let's go to college first just to make sure well, and to kind of book that transition yeah well I mean well what Chris said was he was able to play like one or two pretty early and he had a coaching staff that was dedicated to him I mean like if you really want to go pro you got to be a little selfish with your intentions going in um I mean like like yeah the, the coach is important the coach is very important but the team is almost more important uh I mean because a team can pull you in all different kind of directions if the balance is off to like vaguely put it you know so if, if the team is headed in the right direction and if you've got at least a solid coach, then then I then I think you have a good chance to 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 play good tennis. But if the culture on the team's bad and the coach is good, that's going to be really hard. And uh, and even the other way around, if the coach is bad but the team is really good, you have a better chance of doing well. But it, it's still hard. You know, you definitely need an element of both for sure. You know, some people want to look at the coach and not the team, but but you really better look at the team. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think um, also, too, you have to look at, you know, where you are in that stage of making that decision. You know, um, you know, if you're if you're top 10, top 10 ITF, you know, at that time and, you know, you've got agents, you know, coming after you, you've got spons potential sponsors and, you know, if they guarantee your college education then you know, why not, you know, shoot for the stars. Um, but if you're kind of in that range where maybe you're, you know, you're 400 in the row, maybe 450, somewhere 400, 500, and, you know, no one's really knocking down your door to sign you to Nike or whoever, then I think that's a great pathway nowadays to, you know, go get a scholarship, get a guarantee, say, you know, most of the deals now are if you come here for one year, then we've already, we'll pay for your other three years, you know, and, you know, when you're done, you can come back, so. I think it just depends on where you are, you know, when you're making that decision. So I think it's a great path. You know. and, and sorry, maybe just to add a touch, it's about making it as specific as you can. You know, like if, if you can without stepping on anybody's toes, if your college gives you the ability and the team to make things as specific as you can, I think that works well. Because uh, everything's going to be in general, general in college. Like you're addressing a team, you try to make it specific. Okay. All right, next question is what would be your advice on putting off tournaments to fix uh, technical deficiencies? I think we kind of, we spoke, we, we touched on that a little bit, but more specifically, um, what would be your advice to a parent who has a player, who has a player um, with, with a technical deficiency or whatnot, but you want to put off playing tournaments in order to kind of go back to the drawing board and then clean up some things before getting back out? Let me take this one, T.O. I feel like, um, and I know the question's just 
being put out there, but I want to make sure the, the mindset's correct here. Every year, Jermaine touched on this earlier, we should have a developmental plan and update that plan. Part of that plan should have time in there to fix technical work. And there's a time already based in the development plan for that. I'm assuming the player has that. And I'm assuming that the player has had that talk with coach and parent and whoever to get that done. If that player has not, then go back to your developmental plan and put that in um, and try not to deviate too, too much from your developmental plan because that is also your schedule. That's also what you have. Uh, a lot of times I've, I've seen uh, parents in particular perhaps maybe put a little too much emphasis on the technical work because they, they ascribe a mistake to a technical mistake and therefore that, uh, you know, that issue See, he's got to work on that technique, that technique, that technique solid. And you're like, yeah, and you can work on techniques that you blew in the face and then you, you, can't, you can't win the match. So I feel like it needs to be part of the development plan. I also feel like the tournaments themselves need to be put in there and the right ones need to be put in when everything is more or less solid. I don't work on my technique for two weeks and I'm going to sign up for Easter Bowl. I mean, I need, to, I need to work that out as I'm moving through the whole situation. Easter Bowl is a six-month to nine-month progression of, of tournaments. And I know when that is and I don't need to work on technique in, in March, when I know Easter Bowl's in, in late March, early April. It's just one of those kind of things I need to understand that that's a after Kalamazoo kind of a thing or after, uh, you know, so Kalamazoo kind of a thing. I need to understand that. And that's if I'm not playing U.S. Open Junior. And then that's when I need to kind of look at my time, look at my year and really understand kind of where the year breaks down. A little bit of time at the end of January, at the beginning of January, right after Southerns for some of our kids, a little, a little technical time in there if you want and kind of skip off some of the smaller ones and then get ready to play some of the bigger ones, but coming up at, back in the, in, the, in the late spring. But in general, there's really only about two or three pockets of the year to really work on that. And you really need to really identify that time frame and uh, make sure your developmental plan is intact. So that's already addressed. So I, quick, quick question about that. So you remember, uh, you, have you seen King Richard? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that period where they were at Rick Macy's and, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, Richard told Venus, like, we're not going to play anymore. Time. Well, it's for a different reason, but what I, I'm curious your perspective on, on that, on that whole dynamic where like we're sitting down for a while, we're not playing until I feel like you're ready. Do you feel like that was, I mean, we can't judge what happened because ultimately I guess it worked, but I mean, from, 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 you know, do you advocate or what is your feeling on sitting out for a period, regardless of the momentum, regardless of the, the, the rankings or, or any tournaments that are coming up? I think Richard did it his own way and you can't argue with success. Uh, the, to quote, to put in perspective, I thought she played too many matches there in a row also, according to the movie. I mean, she had, a, I mean, there was a point where she put like 70 matches in a row or something like that. I was like, it's a lot of matches, you know, in a row too. So perhaps that he felt like they need to really break it down and then kind of go the opposite way. Again, I'm not here to critique Richard. He did a phenomenal job at Venus and Serena. I thought they did an awesome job. I, I learned some things and picked up and I talked to Macy about uh, those girls after, for a while afterwards. So uh, I think the issue is though, Again, let's assume you're not as athletic and as tall as Venus is. And if you're not as powerful and as earth break ground breaking as Serena is and was, I mean, let's assume that you are in the, let's just call you, uh, you know, a little more mortal than some of the, uh, these ones that are, that have been at that level. I would tell you that a developmental plan works a little bit easier, a little bit simpler. Um, how long to shut it down? That's the team's conversation. I think that was back to Jermaine's point about having the team let the team decide all that let the team and the players should have a little bit of, of say as they get older too uh in a lot of those early years venus was young i mean so and so richard was speaking for her and knew what she needed you know if i've got a 12 13 14 year old girl who's unreal and beating a lot of the top kids in the 18s yeah i might i might i may take a little time to work on some things you know what i mean because she's got number time you know if i got a girl who's 24 you know i got a girl who's 22 and we're going to spend take some time we're going to technique you know, that, that should have already been taken care of. What you have is pretty much what you have. Mm. All right. Next question. This is coming from a parent of a very talented 10-year-old. Um, he said, how important is watching high-level tennis and developing players or exposing them to that level of tennis? Well, shoot, I want to answer that one. But, yeah, I, I, I'll, my panel. I mean, that's, obvious. that's a no-brainer for me. I mean, you know, I think my – first time going to U.S. Open, you know, changed my life, you know, just the first place I went when I went to U.S. Open was the practice courts. I wanted to see what Nadal was doing on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, you know, when he 
when he wasn't under the lights or, you know, um, but no, that's a no brainer. Like, you know, at every chance you get, I think the, the biggest pro that I've seen coming up when I was like maybe 13, 14 was a guy who was ranked 400 in the world. You know, he was hitting off the wall or something at Bert. I don't know where we were. Um, but you know, I was like, wow, you know? Um, so, you know, you're only as good as your exposure, you know, like if I think Terrell, we talked about this as well. Like, you know, you know, for me, you know, my biggest highlight of my year was like, you know, the state qualifying tournament, you know, or right. the Southern section, you know, had I played ITFs a little bit earlier, got a little bit more exposed, had I traveled, you know, internationally and saw that, hey, sometimes, you know, you, you, you only going to get 20, 30 minutes to practice or maybe you don't even have a practice court sometimes, you know, you got to get what you can get. Um, right. you know, maybe that would have shifted my mindset at a younger age, you know, had I had that exposure. So I think that's so important, you know, because it becomes tangible, something they can touch and see and feel. For sure. And I, and I think it also gives a little bit more direction and incentive in practice to say, like, when you're when the, the highest level of competitor or competition that you've seen was somebody who's number one in the state, then your, your only goal is to be better than them. But then when you see a kid, the number one from Scotland or the number one from Cameroon or the number one from Japan, and you're like, wow, so there are other kids my age that are even better than the ones down the street. Now, when you go into practice, it's like I'm not practicing to get better than them. I'm practicing to be the best for this level. You get what I'm saying? Like it's you almost kind of. Um, it's like it's like a, it's like a shark. They say sharks grow to the level of their container. Like a, if you put a shark in a smaller aquarium, then they'll only get so big. But if you throw them in the ocean, then they'll get four to five times bigger. And it's the same thing, I think, with us as tennis players or developing tennis players. Whatever we've been exposed to kind of determines the capacity that we want to feel. All right, I'm getting into y'all the panel. My bad, my bad, my bad. All right, so I got to... <laughs> Uh, preach, Revin. Uh, my, my man talking about them sharks. <laughs> Listen, I love this oh, stuff, man. Like, I, yeah. my, my man put the animal channel up here. Listen, that's real funny. life, man. That's uh, real life. All right, so my next question is, how do you handle parents that you feel um, are being too involved with their player development and trying to control too much? Um, and then how do you relate as a coach? How do you relay the message um, <laughs> that you're a professional and they should take a step back? So how do you, how do you handle parents who are a little bit too involved um, and a little bit kind of pushy? And then how do you kind of um, relay the message respectfully that listen, I'm a professional, I got you, we'll, we'll take care of this. Give me um, room and space to do what you pay me for. Tori, invite them on Thursday so you don't have to talk to them. <laughs> uh, and tell them to bring their racket and they, and they can jump in. <laughs> Right. I think it goes back to what I mentioned earlier, T.O., um, of what the one thing that Sko Singer did for me that few other parents have done, and that's he gave me complete uh, control and, and autonomy. Uh, I think uh, that was a coach's and a parent conversation. He understood. He trusted what, what I was going to do and, and what I had done. Um, I think a lot of that comes back to two or three things. The parent doesn't trust. Uh, the parent hasn't been educated enough to know how to trust or to trust that particular coach. The, the, co the parent has been burned before, maybe a couple times, uh, and the parent may not fully understand or trust the process. So there's a lot of there's a lot of dynamics in that in as to why that person is there. I think one of the biggest things to get down is is that communication. Uh, the coach isn't going to work well micromanaged. I know I didn't. Um, at the same time, neither is the player. Uh, I think the parent needs to, the coach needs to understand the parent's perspective and where, they, where they've been and what's happened. Um, and I think the coach and the player uh, and the parent, both parent especially, needs to understand, am I grooming my child, especially girls in my opinion, uh, boys is, is worse, but worse later on. The, am I grooming them to be a champion and to take care of their environment on the court? If I'm always micromanaging, trying to tell them what's going on, always speaking for them, I'm getting too involved. I'm robbing them of a great opportunity to grow up and to um, handle these situations. They cannot handle the situation if mom and dad's always handle or whoever that active, overactive, more over involved parent is, they are taking valuable uh, opportunities, learning opportunities to, you're taking them away from the, from the child. If the child is in that moment and can handle their own, well then the child's gonna be a whole lot better when they close that fence and, and, uh, and open that can of balls. So I think that's one of the things that the parent needs to realize, be careful that they don't, 
rob them of the chance to grow up. Because at some point, you're going to want your kid to say, mom, dad, I got this. Mm. You got to make sure you're grooming them for that opportunity. So the over-involvement to me almost uh, almost defeats that. I've never seen an over-involved parent always speaking for, always talk, And I've seen an aggressive kid that really could handle things on their own well. Uh, they've never been given the chance to. Yeah, and I think I think it goes back to it, making sure that you do have a good plan. If you have a developmental plan, then you are effectively communicating with the parents. And then I think now we understand the team dynamic and everyone can sort of get in their, their right lanes. You, there's going to always be some parents that are just going to be a little bit more heavily involved, I think. But again, we should be on the same page and going in the same direction so it won't still be a bunch of crashes. You just go, yeah. some of the personality stuff you just have to, you, you will learn to deal with. You know what I mean? But the plan is the plan. And this is what we're doing. Do we agree on it? And then let's go. And so I think it's important to make sure that that's clear. Nice. Well, that was that was very, very neat. Nice. That's from the OGs, the, those who've done it a couple of times. Cause uh yeah, I know, I know that's not an easy dynamic to have to 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 figure out. All right. Hey, well, uh, pretty, let me give you one. I hope it's 30 second story. We coached a parent and Jermaine and uh, Nate, you guys may know the girls. We coached the family, the, uh, the Burdett family for a long time. Uh, Aaron, Lindsay and Mallory Burdett. Great girls. Uh, they actually had an older son who played at West Point. Uh, Andy, great kids. Short story. We are at Easter Bowl one year and Lindsay, for all your parents, Lindsay played uh, one Orange Bowl in the 12s. Uh, and so we're, we're at Easter Bowl one year, 14s, whatever. And we called Judy Coach Judy because she was always throwing her two cents in there, over involved, always micromanaging. Coach Judy, at one point, I literally, you know, the smartphones are coming out. So I literally taped Judy one match. She said, I don't know why Lindsay won't hit the ball, you know, just always talking. And, and you know, sure, sure enough, Lindsay won the match, but she, uh, she was pushing. Next match, you know, Lindsay comes out being more aggressive. And I don't know why Lindsay won't just make the ball. I mean, why is she making all these mistakes? So by about the third match, I had taped her from the previous three matches. And I had literally take these, took these snippets of all how much she kept changing her, her opinion on everything going on. Well, the irony of this is, of course, when Lindsay went on and played Stanford All-American and, and national champion, did great. The one child that got top 100 that did the best was Mallory. And, Lynn, and and Judy did very little. She almost, she had her first one or two. She did she did well, kind of whatever Andy did, he did. It was almost a bonus. Aaron won a round or two Australia doubles before she went to college, was just a great doubles player and good kid. She tried to really do everything she could with Lindsay. And Lindsay was really good early on and could, probably could have been better with a little less involvement. And Mallory, who she almost just threw her out there, just look, look, go to drills, you know, and, and figure it out. And Mallory ended up being the best kid. So I know that's a longer than 30 seconds, but the point I'm getting at was you had four good kids, three of them all Americans and NCAA champs at Stanford uh, that had same parents, same situation, the same mom did less with the one that did the best. And I think clearly she came you know, on the heels of three other really good players, but I think it's something to be said for, uh, the parent appreciating that the kid needs to needs to figure it out and have that have the ability to do so uh, would just be the last thing I would say for that over involved parent. Sometimes you might actually hurt that kid more long term than you realize. Wow. Oh, all right. Well, if those are all the questions, those are all the questions that I received in the chat. So I'll, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up, man. Uh, if uh, my panelists could le leave with uh, any any closing statements, and we'll go ahead and call it a night. Appreciate you guys. Uh, Tori, Greg, I appreciate the perspective big time. Oh, the Chiefs. Oh, you should have the Falcons. You should represent the Falcons. Um, you know, <laughs> Jermaine, always appreciate the perspective. I'll be, yeah. down, I'll be down in Orlando. I'm actually flying out in an hour, so I'll be in Orlando all next week. So, uh, so I'll see you at some point. Thanks for having me, T.O. Uh, no problem. No Thanks, problem. Posh. Tell Dallas. Man, it's – I it's so, it's so I good to will. see all you guys, man. I'm going to tell you that much right now. And um, I just hope that we can spend a little more time like this a little bit more often. We're kind of spread out a little bit and, and we're all doing big things. And so it's so nice to see you guys. Let's just keep working hard, keep developing these young players and uh, enjoying our time on our court. Good to see you all. Take care now. Absolutely. And, and, and I talked to, uh, just to throw it out there, I spoke with, uh, I spoke with Coach TH. I had an idea earlier today. Maybe we'll try to get like a weekend camp or something together where you guys can maybe 
kind of share some things in person for, with the kids as well as the parents, um, maybe over in the summertime or whatnot. But yeah, just let an idea of throwing it out there. Just let me know. I say, T.O., thanks for having me. Jay, super proud of your brother. Keep it up. Keep up. Keep doing big things. Uh, Posh, obviously very proud of you, all the the, uh, the people. Look, I want to say hi to the, to the Banks girls. Good to see you all. Uh, everybody, uh, Blanks brother, I should say, uh, just obviously EJ uh, and everybody else on the CJ, obviously on the call. I see a few of the names here. Just want to say thanks for having me. Happy to be here. And let me know about the next one. Um, Again, uh, Jay, tell uh, Nat I said hello and everybody down there. And, we'll do. and uh, like I said, I'm going to go watch my Chiefs. And uh, T.O., again, great uh, job. This whole deal right here. Good to see you, T.O. Take care, Thank man. You. Absolutely. Hey, same for me. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Um, thanks for all the people who made it. CJ, Torres, the Torres family. Um, EJ, good to catch up with you. Good to see you. And um, Nate, I'll see you soon. But hey, yep. um, Terrell, I'm, I'm going to be in Rome um, this this fall next weekend, Rome, Georgia. So I'll see if maybe okay. we can um, set something up, maybe link up in Atlanta sometime. Um, For sure. Sounds good, man. I'm check you out. So, yeah, we'll talk offline. Yes, All sir. Right. Whitney McCray, I see you. What's yeah, up, Whitney McCray snuck in here, you know. Oh, Whitney, Whitney, what's up? Uh, hey, we, guys. We got her on the panel <laughs> next time. <laughs> good you to see you all. Yeah, yeah. I see yeah. you. Uh, it's Monet. an Atlanta thing. It's an Atlanta Monet. thing. Come on. You got, look, look, you got you to gotta put NCAA champion in front of her name, though. Yeah, you got to right. put some respect on it, huh? <laughs> I just swiped my screen and saw Whitney McCray up in there. I'm like, oh, there we go. So anyway, anybody else I'm missing, forgive me. Uh, we'll see everybody soon. I got to check out this Chiefs game. Great seeing everybody. Terrell, uh, thanks, brother. Appreciate it. EJ, thanks, we'll talk soon, brother. Oh, yeah. Thank you, guys. See you guys. All take right, care, y'all. You all have a good evening. Right. And uh, take care. Thanks for joining. I appreciate it. Take care.